Okay, this is class nine in the book To Pray as God Would Pray. The first mimer, which is Hashem Safasai Tiftach. You can follow along online on the um on Chabad.org. They have this, they have this mimer in digital copy, or you can get the book. So we're just going to review. I will. I will also tell you that all the previous classes are posted on our YouTube channel already, so you can review the classes and you can catch up if you've missed any classes. You can search YouTube for I think Hashem Safasai Tiftach, or you can search YouTube for the Beis Menachem channel. I think it will come up either way. But the first eight classes are on there. Um, and this is and this is class nine. Okay, um, so just to review where we're, where we're up to in the mind, we're up to section four, but what where how we got here, what is that the mind is based on the Pesach, may Hashem open my lips, Hashem Safasa, Tifta, Hashem open my lips, and my mouth will recite your praise. So this is from Tehillim. We say it before we begin Shemona Esrei, and um, the question of the Maima, which really has three levels to it, is why did we, why did the sages put this verse before uh, the beginning of Shemona Esrei, the Amida prayer? Why is it not before the beginning of davening in, in, entirely? Meaning, we're asking Hashem to help open our mouth. That would seem to be the place to do that would be right as we're beginning to daven, not right before Shemona Esther, which is right in the middle of davening. Then it's just, it's still the same question, but we make the question even stronger because there is uh, an Amira in the Gemara. Rav Bruna said that he linked Geula to Tfila, which meant Shema to Shemona Esther, and he was very happy. And the question of the Gemara is, well, what does it mean he linked Geula to Tfila? He linked Shema to Shemona Esther, the Brach of Ga'al Yisrael to Shemona Esther, which is what that phrase linking the Ula Tefila means. Um, how could he say that? We say the Pasuk Hashem Safasa Tiftach in the middle. So how is he linking it? And the answer is no, that's not considered to be a separation. We are linking, he, he is linking and we are linking the Ula Tefila when we say it. But then that just makes the question even stronger. Why do we have to put the Pasuk there so that we have a question? How could it be that we're linking the Ula Tefila you know, even though the puzzle is there, just put the puzzle someplace else and we don't have the question. And then that question is even made even stronger um, because there's very, uh, there's, there's very uh, intense um, spiritual ramifications, I guess you could say, or um, effects of linking the Ula to Tefillah, of linking the Brach Gai Yisrael to Shman Esrei. There's very mystical effects that become very practical in the world of linking the concept of redemption to the concept of tefillah. And the Maira goes into a lot of detail with that with Yosef and Yehuda and Malchus and Yisoid and, you know, the way, the, the, our ability to uh, uh, bring godliness into the world and elevate the sparks of godliness all have to do with this concept of connecting Shema to Shema to Esrei, which is Geula to tefillah. Um, and it has like cosmic repercussions. We're not going to go into all of those details again now, just, but that's like the bulk of the rest of the first section of the Mimer, which talks about that. And so therefore the question again is strengthened. Um, yes, it's true that this puzzle does not actually stop us from being able to do that. We already have that answer in the Gemara. It doesn't stop us. It's still considered to be linked, but still it begs the question, why are we putting it there? It seems like it's making some kind of separation, even though it's not, and requires us to like ask the question, why is it there? And answer the question, okay, it's not actually making a separation, but like, why not just put it someplace else and we don't have any issue, you know? So obviously there's this very specific reason why that verse is in that spot in davening. Section two uh, talks about, uh, it begins, the explanation by giving us background information and talking about the whole concept of davening and learning Torah and what the difference is between them. Um, and that in general, uh, to, the difference between uh, davening and learning Torah, when, when a person is learning Torah, he's drawing godliness into the world. 
um, he is bringing godliness downward and, and it's not as necessary for the person to be on a high level. Then he needs to be some sort of a vessel for this, but he's not like actually, um, it's not actually dependent on his level. Whereas davening, we are actually trying to sort of elevate um, the upward motion. We're trying to elevate and ourselves in the world with Hashem. And that does depend more on the person's level because it's the person who's doing this work. Um, and then the Rebbe also goes into some mystical connections with this idea to explain it a little bit more. Um, and then goes into this idea, but even though that's true in general, that Torah is generally bringing godliness down into the world and Torah is generally ascending upward, it is also true that there's an aspect of davening that um, resembles Torah study, which is that phrase, Hashem sefasai tiftach, ofiyagiti lesefa, that that phrase, Hashem, open my lips, my mouth will recite your praise, actually is the level of Torah learning in davening, um, which the level of Torah learning, again, is the idea of drawing godliness down into the world, and it's not so dependent on our particular level, um, but it's just drawing godliness down into the world. Um, and then that's like the Torah, the way or a level of davening that's similar to Torah learning. And then that explains that there's a level of Torah learning that's also similar to davening, meaning there's a meaning there's a style of Torah learning which is from above to below, and there's a style of Torah learning which is from below to above as well and they're compared to dew and rain right the dew just comes by itself but rain has to evaporate first and then come down um and that these two ideas are two different levels so there's actually both aspects to both tyra and davening even though the main thrust of tyra learning is is drawing down and the main thrust of davening is elevating but they each have both components um, and in the next section, in section three, the Rebbe talks about these two levels of Torah learning, basically the idea that, you know, what the concept that whenever a person da, uh, learns Torah, Hashem is learning Torah, this is like a higher level that during the first three hours of the day that Hashem occupies himself with Torah learning. Um, and... The, and then there, the then there's the level of like when the person is learning Torah, Hashem, Hashem is learning opposite him, which more is dependent on the person's level. And then the Rebbe explains that these two levels are really called in our like that's in the mystical realms, but in our physical realms, they parallel the idea of learning the Shema Torah for this for the sake of Torah and learning Shalom the Shema just for our own gain, basically, and how those are two levels of Torah learning which parallel these two different levels of learning, one on a higher level than the other. Um, and that, you know, when a person is learning the Shema, they're not conscious of themselves. They're just learning for Torah's sake, for Hashem's sake. That's obviously a higher level. And Shalom the Shema, not for the sake of heaven, is just like for our own personal gain. It's more consistent with our vessel, whatever level we're at. And then there says a similar thing applies to davening, that even though in general davening is the idea of elevation, there's also these two levels. Um, and one of the levels is the idea that a person is completely nullified to Hashem, um, sort of like learning Lishma, which is like has nothing to do with me, it just has to do with God. I'm just learning for the sake of Torah. Uh, um, so too, there's this type of davening, which is just completely butzel, given over self-nullified to Hashem. It's not about me. That's like a higher level of davening. Um, and then he, when a person is davening at that level, it's as if when he's saying the words, he's just repeating what Hashem is telling him to say. The way that when he learns Torah, he's just saying the words of Torah. It's not his own level. It's not his own consciousness of himself and his needs or anything like that. It's just, he's, it's a higher level that he's, it's just about Hashem and he's repeating those words. Um, and of course, in this section, it's going to say that this Pasuk Hashem Tiftach basically represents that higher level, which Reb already told us in an earlier section of the Mimer, but now he's going to elaborate. He's told us that fact in an earlier section. Now he's going to elaborate on what that means. Okay? Are we like ready to roll? All right. Let's do it. 
So section four. So this is the meaning, meaning this last line, right? That we'll just maybe review um, the last paragraph of the previous section. Uh, similar concepts apply with regard to prayer, which means these two motifs of down, up, up, down, you know, like there's two levels and so on. Although in prayer as a whole, the emphasis is on the efforts of man as he exists in this lowly realm and his striving for spiritual refinement. That's generally what davening is about, generally. There is a higher level of prayer that is not dependent on man's efforts. Instead, the person is entirely bottled, he's self-nullified, and when he prays, he resembles a person who merely repeats what a reader is saying. That's all that he's doing. So now, okay, we're not going to go into the footnote. We did that last week. Okay, so but so... Basically, that idea that there is the higher level of davening as well, and he's just repeating the words. It's like it's not about him. It's just about doing what God wants. It's about saying the words that God wants us to say kind of thing. So now in section four, this is the meaning of the request. God, open my lips. Hashem Safasai Tiftah, this puzzle that we've been talking about, which is described as an extension of prayer. Remember, we said why is this not called a, a separation by the Gemara? Why is it not called a separation? Even though Rabbi Runga said it and Rabbi Yochanan asked, isn't that a separation? And the answer was, it's not a separation. He could still say he linked Geula to Tefillah, even though he said this verse between them, because it's an, called an extension of prayer. We don't, it's not, it's not a, it's not a separation. Um, it's called an extension of prayer. Oh, see section one, which states that our sages extended the Shemona Esther by including this request at the beginning of that prayer, like we just said. So that, that verse, Hashem Safa Zaytiftach, is called an extension of prayer. The simple meaning is that the person is completely overcome by bittal, self nullification, given over to Hashem, and asks God to open his lips and allow his mouth to recite your praise. Like, you just, you just help me. Moreover, the term yagid, right? Hashem safasai tiftach ufi yagid tehila secha. My mouth will recite your praise. The term yagid in Hebrew, it's not the most common term for speech. We have it for Haggadah in Pesach, but it's not the most common. Yomar or yidaber or something. Those are much more common terms for speaking. But the, so the term yagid is a little unusual and it has a significance. The term yagid translated as recite also has the implication of drawing down. The, the footnote just gives us the source, which is in the pre Chaim, it's a Kabbalistic book, that this term means to draw down. So when we're, so basically a person's bitzel, a person's self nullification enables him to reach a level wherein his prayers are not his own. They are the words of, they're not the words of a mere, mere mortal. Instead, his mouth is reciting your praise, God's own words of praise. That's, um, that's what he's, that is what's happening. That he's not only saying his own words, he's reciting the, the words that Hashem says, so to speak. He's reciting your praise, God's own words of praise. That's why I think this uh, Myra's call to praise God would pray, right? Like he's saying what God would say. Through such prayer, by just completely being uh, self-effacing, so to speak, the person is able to draw the person draws down influence from above in a manner that will not be held up in the intermediate levels of the spiritual cosmos, but instead will be manifest on the earthly plane as it exists above. In other words, if a person can be so self-effacing in their davening, and they're not the words of a mere mortal, but instead they're reciting your praise, God's own words of praise, what happens is that that brings down divine influence to the world at a very high level without any blockages. Look at the footnote. It says, prayer has the potential to draw down influence from God's essence. That's, I mean, that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to create a new will in Hashem to open an 
obvious good for everybody or whatever it is that we're davening for, right? Like we we're trying to draw down a new influence from God's essence. Nevertheless, there are myriads of intermediate levels between God's essence and our material world. On each of these levels, there's a process of judgment to determine whether the person is worthy of having the influence pass from that level to a lower one. By and large, only the prayers of a truly refined individual are capable of having an obvious and immediate effect on this material world. We ask, we ask a salad, for example, for a bracha, right? For, 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 for him to daven for us. See Mrs. Berchas Kainim and Derek Mrs. Sacha. All of this applies, however, when one's prayers are his own and therefore depend on his degree of refinement. When, however, one's mouth recites your praise, the prayers are God's, as if, as, as it were. Hence, they draw down the different levels of spiritual cosmos oh, through, sorry, they draw down, they are drawn down through the different levels of the spiritual cosmos without any impediment. If we're saying the words of Hashem, then they have the ability to just come straight down. They don't have, they don't get blocked. When prayer follows the motif of an upward ascent, the influence it arouses can be held up in the intermediate spiritual realms. The footnote, since it is dependent on the person's refinement, if that refinement is not complete, there may be obstacles for the influence to descend in this material plane, as explained in the previous note. All right? If, if, it's, if it's worthy, it'll go through. If it's strong enough, it will go through. If it's not strong enough, it won't go through. When, however, one's prayers reflect the higher level described here, the extension of prayer, that Hashem Safas Tifta, the influence aroused by prayer is immediately drawn down at that time and in that place. This is the higher level of davening, right? We talked about two levels of Torah learning, higher and lower, lishma and not lishma, for the sake of heaven and not for the sake of, for the sake of Torah, for, not for the sake of Torah, for the sake of heaven, not for the sake of heaven. And here we're talking about two levels of davening, our own davening, which we need to do. It's not that we don't, you know, we still do it, which depends on our level of refinement because it's us and we're doing it. And then this higher level where we are just sort of transparent to godliness and saying God's words, as it were. And that doesn't have, that's not dependent on us because it's like, we know the formula, we're saying the formula, the formula is potent whether or not the person who is saying is on a high level because it's not our formula, it's God's formula. So it's, it works like, because we're just a servant of Hashem saying those words. Okie doke. Next section. <laughs> um, this, yes, you have a question. Are you taking questions right now? Yeah, we can take questions. So this gets like, when you're trying to work on Kavana, then all of a sudden you're back in it again. So it's like, I get it. I get what you're saying here, like as much as I can, obviously, at this level. So there, that that flow feeling of just releasing it, and it's it's God God's words. But there's that there's often during prayer when you're trying to bring back your covenant because your shopping list just came out and into your head, and so a lot going on. I don't know if that's a question, but like it feels like. So when you're trying to bring in Kavanah, now all of a sudden you've inserted ego again, yourself again, but you're trying to really be tool at the same time. And how do you do both of those at the same time? That's my question. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, when I have a down pad, I'll be able to tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> this, is a, this is the work of a lifetime, you know? Um, but I guess that, you know, that, 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 that by itself is a prayer, meaning that by itself is the kavana to ask Hashem to help you surpass yourself and, you know, just make yourself a vessel for Hashem and be bottle. That by itself is a, pro a proper kavana. 
you know, it says in Hayom Yom, if a person doesn't know how to daven with all the proper intentions that it says in the book and the works of Kabbalah, they should pray with the intention that their prayers should be uh, counted and, you know, considered as if they had all the proper intentions because they don't know what they are, you know, so that's also a proper kavana, right? But it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long process and it's, and it, do, it doesn't happen evenly every time we dive in either, right? It's not like, oh, we get, we get somewhere and then we're like, we're in that spot for the rest of our lives. No, we like do lots of backsliding and so on. Um, but one, and I'm not saying this is that level, one idea that could help us possibly you know, is, is, is like what we're taught that there's certainly we dive into a revealed good and that's appropriate and it should always be that way. And we also can dive in that we like where we accept whatever Hashem's will is and that, you know, whatever Hashem's will is as opposed to davening for a specific outcome. You know, we dive in that the outcome should be revealed good and that it should be according with Hashem's will. And we should we should be able to, you know, align with Hashem's will. Um, and we, we definitely do down for reveal good. But instead of asking, like, I don't know if a person's applying for a job that this job should work out. Well, maybe there's something better than this job waiting for you. Like, why put all your intention to something that might not be the best thing for you we don't know if that's the best thing for us Hashem knows so we can put our intention to like I'm going to be a vessel to your will like whatever if this is the best thing then you know please let it work out in an easy revealed way but if you have something else in store for me then that you know let me see that like that's a little bit of the idea of it's not this highest level that the mime is talking about but but it's a little bit this idea of like being a vessel to Hashem, you know, not inserting ourselves too much in the process of life. And at the same time, you know, being responsible for what we need to be responsible for, right? Like we're still applying for a job, let's say, I mean, in this example, right? We're still doing, we're still doing the application. We're still going to the interview. We're just recognizing that if this is not going to work out, then Hashem has something that's better in store for me. Um, and sort of like aligning ourselves with that. So like we can align ourselves with that even at the beginning, not just at the end, not just when the when they say, no, we're not hiring you, let's say in this example, right? Saying, okay, it's meant to be. But even in the beginning, we can start the process by saying like, and that's how we were taught as Hasidim to like write into the Rebbe, for example, right? We don't, we... We at we don't ask that something work out. We ask for the Rebbe's opinion and advice, and if it's a pro and if it's proper that this should work out. But we leave that little opening that if it's not proper, it shouldn't work out. Something else is going to work out. That's but you know we we uh, we align ourselves. I mean, there's a story of a chassid who came to the Rebbe and he he told the Rebbe about certain business dealing I don't know something he's going to do and he asked the Rebbe for a bracha but he didn't ask the Rebbe for advice so the Rebbe gave him a bracha but it didn't work out he went back to the Rebbe and he said why did you not tell me it's not going to work out and the Rebbe said a gentleman never um puts his opinion when it's not asked so if you ask a question or in this case if you're davening for something specific it's one thing but if we ask the question or we say that we're open to whatever you want that's a little I guess that's like a miniature practice exercise of trying to like help ourselves not be only centered on ourselves maybe that's a suggestion I'm not saying it's you know perfect whatever but it's this it's a suggestion like getting into that could maybe help a little That, that takes a lifetime, Kaya, to, to really perfect yeah. that. It really does, yeah. And um, and sometimes we're better at it in one area than in others, and sometimes we're right. better in one, one day than another day, or sometimes right. we're better, we, we manage to do it in one situation, but we can't do it in other situations. So, sometimes in a strange kind of way, those big things that are very obvious, it's easier, and the small things like when the, you know, washing machine breaks, it's harder, 
it let you know those new those like nuisances it, it, it you know it's it's sometimes harder to be like okay yeah your will is that's what's gonna happen you know yeah that's true that's true at least it's with god's kindness it's always god's kindness well, that, 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 god's there's kindness. there's a part, part part of our prayers are aligned with god automatically because he's he's because we're sort of like riding on his coattails kind of thing but at certain points is if I'm understanding what what's been said here and I think that's part of God's kindness is that is that he gives us a little boost so that we're not always we don't that our prayers that our prayers are not they're not always so disgraceful uh you know that they're 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 better than that he gives us help he gives us help if I understand this correctly well, what, one of one of the, I mean, I think one of the ideas of davening is that we, um, um, much of the davening is actually words of David HaMelech and Tehillim or of, uh, you know, things from Chumash, right? Shema, Az Yashur, these are things from Chumash or things that the, the great men of the Great Assembly put together. Like we recognize that those were, even I suppose at some level, at a, a, lo, at a very sort of, um, pedestrian level or you know like like you know regular level the fact that we use the words of the sitter to daven from is a little bit this idea too like we are we're you know we're we are acknowledging the greatness of the people and their ability to express um davening and we are uh, aligning ourselves with that with those words is a, li a little bit maybe, maybe part of this idea, right? Uh, um, to, to some extent. And again, just to like make it a full picture here, like the mitzvah of tefillah also includes davening for your own needs, meaning that's not something we're not supposed to do. We are supposed to do it. If we have a need, we're supposed to turn to God. I mean, we all have needs. <laughs> Um, we're supposed to turn to God and ask for it and thank him for what he's done for us, right? Like there is that peace because we are still bodies and souls living in the physical world and we do need food and we do need shelter and we do need clothing and we, you know, we, and like the Ramam says, who else are we supposed to turn to? Meaning the only person who can do that is Hashem. So I'm not person, but you know, the only one who can do that is Hashem. We can't, we shouldn't rely on other situations to do that for us. So therefore, um, we are supposed to ask for that as well. But that's not the sum total of the davening. Then also, there's a part of davening that's Hashem Sefasei Tiftach. In fact, Hashem Sefasei Tiftach, as the section of the Bible is going to say, comes before we ask for our material needs. The Shemana is full of material needs questions, which, he, which he's going to say in the next section. So it's not, we're not like, it's sort of like a, it's a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like, it's, a, it's you know, once you reach that level, then you, then you can ask for your physical needs differently almost, you know? Anyway. All right. Ready to continue? Oh, Carolyn has a question. I don't know. I'm I'm just thinking, I don't even know if I can express this, but it seems like it's like spiritual feeding and you could on, on bottom, we can only accept what we can change from higher levels. It's like, and changing it into a physical world that we can use and getting things we need. There has to be some, it's a, it seems like a spiritual journey because down through the levels and everybody's on a different level. But at some point, the spiritual thing that you collect in whatever level you're at in the, um, in your vessel has to change to something physical in this world at some point. You, do you know what I mean? You understand? I'm, that we are that we that we are physical and we and we want the when we pray we're praying 
for spirituality to come down. And then at some point we want it, we have to have a vessel to, so it changes into something physical that we want. It's a sp like a spiritual highway of different levels. And we're each giving to somebody when we pray, we're each kind of bringing down things from low, we can only bring down to the lower levels, depending on where we are. Well, the, the, high, the yeah. higher level we're on, the lower we can bring the light. <laughs> Correct. The, so you could, you know, so we're kind of feeding each other spirituality as we go down and eventually hopefully you have a vessel that can contain something that you're asking for. But it has to be changed in some point to the physical world. No? <laughs> well, I guess um, we want we want that light of Hashem to come down in the physical world and have physical, tangible goodness revealed, goodness in the physical world. And I suppose if you're talking about like a relationship with Hashem and that type of thing as physical, because it's maybe it's felt in the heart and the mind, you know, it's not tangible, but it might be physical right. because we're physical beings. So there's different levels of bringing it into the physical world, some more tangible and some less tangible. Like what would you call peace of mind? It's not tangible, but it is um, in the, it's within the physical realm because it's within the person who lives within the physical realm. So there is something but physical it's about it, but it's not tangible. Whereas you know, food and clothing and a house are actually tangible, you know, like those are well, actually yeah. tangible in the physical world. So there's even in the physical world, there's levels of blessing, some more and some less tangible. But even peace of mind, you have to then create through your feelings of peace of mind, yeah. something good. Usually, if you have peace of mind, what you do in the world, physical world, is comes out as something usually good for others, I guess. Right. So you're saying so you have to create, make it tangible, otherwise, no one benefits from it. So the fulfillment of your request, you're saying, brings a tangible blessing to the world through you. If yes, and anybody who is on that level who has a, a vessel for it. Interesting. What do you, no. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, interesting. I mean, does it I don't, you know, mm -hmm. that's just what I was thinking. Well, thanks for sharing so it. So it's, it's really giving to others. Yeah. Well, that's definitely. <laughs> Look down. That's, defini know. that's definitely um, an, uh, an important part of the process of life, right? Like we want to be able to spread the blessings that we have. Well, thanks for sharing that idea. That's a that's, a be that's beautiful, Carolyn. Yeah. It really is. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I think if it if I'm understanding Carolyn correctly, I think what what Carolyn might even be referring to is from um, the whole Seder, his, his Straussius, the, the chain of revealed brachos coming down that we ring down through our tefillah. And that when, when Carolyn is talking about the vessel and, and the level that we're on, that based on what our vessel is able to receive, we can then bring down sort of almost like a shape sorter. You know, like if you picture a, a, a little one with a shape sorter, so only a certain shape fits in a certain opening. And so depending on the level that we're on and we've developed our vessel, then we can receive. Right, we can perceive and we can also be open to receive that light in that shape or that bracha in that shape. And then when we receive that, other people around us also um, are exposed to that bracha and that sort of shape in our shape sorter that, that our vessel can now accommodate.
Mm -hmm. Interesting thoughts, everyone. Yeah. Simply want to say something. Thank you, Eliza. Simcha? I have a question just about the line in general, but to go along with what Carolyn was saying, is that like all the brachas that we receive or all the things we do affect all of Claudia Sorrell? No, isn't it like written in many places that because we're not, we're part of the whole community, the whole, we're all one, just like we were all one when we were at Mount Sinai and everything we do, like we're all working to bring Mashiach and to bring out all the light in the world. So everything we do, that's why we never know like where we stand on which side, like always think like you're in the middle and you're tipping the scale this way for everybody, not, not just ourselves, but like, I don't know, I kind of related a little to that. But my question is going back to the, with the mind of the, when you said before, did I understand correctly that the line that's, in between the one that we're talking about um oh, you're frozen simcha am i frozen too no am i no okay so it's so it's simcha maybe you can i don't know if you can hear us maybe you can move to a different place in your house or i'm gonna i'm gonna let me see if I can WhatsApp her or that she's frozen and maybe we can continue. And then when she comes back, she can ask her question. Um, by now she probably realized she's frozen, but. Okay, let's continue. And then hopefully she'll be back soon and she can ask her question. Ah, maybe she's coming back now. Okay. Let's continue and then we'll see if she gets back on. Um, okay, sec section five. Did anybody else want to say anything in the meantime or ready to go on to section five? Okay, section five. On this basis, we can understand why the phrase Hashem open my lips is recited specifically before Shmona Asrei. Um, why is it before Shmona Esrei, right? I.e. Shmona Esrei, not the beginning of the entire prayer service. That's the original question of the mimer. In other words, remember we said, yes, it's true that it's not considered to be a separation. Oh, here she is. It's, it's, do you want to ask your question, Simcha? Just real quick, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. Okay, I don't know what happened. Um, so you said that all the other times, all the other prayers, I thought I understood that there's intermediaries. So it doesn't go straight like to Hashem. There's everybody, you know, kind of, there's all the levels judging. Is it going straight up? And then are we receiving? So this line itself is like a direct because whoever wrote it and put it there. Who wrote it and put it there? Well, it's uh, the phrase is from David Hamalach. From David Hamalach. So this line itself, though, no, is just no. like God's words, and so we're just using God's words, and so it goes straight to Hashem, like no intermediaries in between, so that we can, while we're then davening, have it receive all the. I got confused when you said that. The 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 the. Pasuk Hashem Sefasai Tiftah represents the higher level of davening, which mm -hmm. is that um, the person is completely nullified to Hashem. So when he's davening, it's not his own words, it's the words of Hashem. And mm -hmm. that enables the, the person to draw down influence from above to below without any blockages and that's why it's not a half sick that's why it's not a separation um so it's not a it's not a half sick well it draws down things without a separation that's the higher level of mm -hmm. that it's not dependent on the person's vessel because it's not he's not bringing himself into it when we are davening in a way that it is us davening to Hashem, that's going from below to above, mm -hmm. then 
it could be stopped along the way. But when we're just saying the words of Hashem and we're completely nullified, then then that's called an extension of prayer that like whatever that's called an extension of prayer that's called the higher level which is nicknamed an extension of prayer mm-hmm. um, then it's it, it it happens automatically now okay i it that phrase represents this level i don't know if we can say that every time we say that phrase we're accessing that level but that's what this phrase represents and therefore it doesn't it's not a separation because it, this is what it's representing got it okay thank you Chaya. okay okay section five on this basis we can ex- understand why the phrase god opened my lips is recited specifically before the beginning of the shmona esrei remember the original question was why is it why is it said there not at the beginning of davening especially because it seems to be so significant to connect the bracha ga israel to the amida so why would we put it there when it seems like it's a separation that necessitates us to ask the question and have the answer that it's actually not a separation meaning why put it there what what's the point of there must be a very good reason why it's there not at the beginning of davening so here we are at the answer <laughs> Here's the very good reason of why it's there and not at the beginning of davening. The 12 intermediate blessings, okay, so of Shmona Esrei. So he's going to explain what does it mean? The 12 intermediate blessings. In practice, in case anybody gets off of this uh, class and t- opens up their sitter and decides to count the blessings, you will actually find there to be 13 intermediate blessings. So in practice, there are 13 intermediate blessings. When the sages of the Great Assembly, the Anshe Knesset Hagdola, or originally ordained the structure and wording of the prayer services, they composed 12 intermediate blessings for the Amida, which we see, right, if you notice on Shabbos or on Yom Tif, the Amida, the Shemona Esrei, always begins and ends the same, and the middle section is cha- changes, and it changes whether it's weekday, Shabbos, Rosh Chodesh, Yamtiv, it, it's the middle section that changes. And in the weekday prayer, there are 12, actually 13, intermediate blessings. And the, that section is what changes. So when the Anshay Knesset Hagdola originally ordained the structure and the wording of the prayer, they composed 12 intermediate blessings. At a later time, the sages instituted a 13th blessing, basically to protect people from informers, which was a big issue at the time. Um, the Lamal Shinim, that's the one that was added, which is about informers. Nevertheless, although there are actually 13 intermediate blessings, because additional blessing was only added because of a special circumstance, it is common practice to refer to the 12 intermediate blessings, just as it is common practice to speak of the Shmana Esrei, which means 18, even though it actually includes 19 blessings. That's just how it is. Some things never change. So that's like, that's how it is. It's called the Shemona Esrei or the Amidah, the, the prayer of 18 blessings, even though there's 19 blessings. Um, so they just don't want you to get confused. But back into the text of the Mimer, the 12 intermediate blessings of Shemona Esrei are prayers for material influence, requesting that our years be blessed and the sick be healed. For example, right? The years be blessed. You recognize that. The must, material prosperity, the sick be healed is blessing for the for Rafu Shlema. So there's these 12 intermediate blessings and they all have to do with material needs, which is, and in the middle, and and that they're, and on Shabbos, they have to do with Shabbos and on Yantif, they have to do with Yantif, right? They, those middle sections change depending on the day. But the point is that we add this line before Shman Esrei, um, which is, going to be during the weekday is going to be filled with these 12 or 13 requests for physical needs so it is the so why do we ha- why was it specifically put there here we go ladies here's the answer to our question drum roll please it is the preparatory service of bittel which is expressed through the extension of prayer which is the request that god opened my lips that enables these blessings to become manifest and, and the influence to be drawn down to the physical plane. Dun, 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 dun. That's it. 
<laughs> That's the answer to our question. We have now answered the question, right? It's only, it's through reaching this level of bitzel, which is represented by this line. And again, you know, at some level, when we say it, we have reached it, right? Because we're saying it. And I suppose there's probably myriads and myriads and infinite levels of reaching that level, right? But like, there's some level of it. We say it before Shemun Esrei, and that enables the blessings that we're about to ask for to become manifest and drawn down um, into the physical world. Because like we just said, when we daven with Bittel and we're saying the words of God, that enables the light to just come down into the world and not have any impediments. There's a footnote here. As explained previously, the implication in our divine service to this phrase of God open my lips, being included as an extension of prayer is that one is not reciting his own words of prayer, but he is rather repeating God's prayer. Hence the title in English to pray as God would pray, right? We're saying God's prayer. It's not our own prayer. When doing so, instead of man merely drawing down godly blessings in a manner commensurate with his own limited efforts, man serves as a medium to draw down God's infinite light because it's not about his vessel anymore, because he's buttle, so he's transparent. He's just being a conduit. Unlimited influence, whoops, unlimited influence is drawn down without having to reckon with the limited process of downward progression that characterizes the spiritual cosmos. That doesn't have to go through all these multiple stages and like, you know, I guess you could compare it maybe to like trying to drive someplace in New York. I don't know if people have seen this, but like on the, where, which highway is it? Um, give me a second. Okay, it doesn't really even matter which highway it is, but there's a highway and, you know, it's very congested and let's say it has twists and turns and exits and you get on, or even like you can imagine, you know, like a city street, it twists and turns and you have to turn this way and that way and you, to get someplace. And then they build some kind of a ramp or like some kind of a super highway that goes on top of all of that, you know, and it's just a straight shot to from this point to this point. And you don't have to worry about all the traffic and the twists and turns like on the ground that you're that in order to get there, which maybe there's a stop sign and maybe there's a traffic light, maybe there's traffic and maybe there's an accident and things get delayed. Whereas, you know, if you get onto this, you know, like an express lane on a highway kind of a thing, but even more, right? If you get onto this ramp, that's sort of like, or maybe a good muscle, like the tunnel, almost like, well, the ramp is better because it's higher, but like the tunnel, you know, there's tunnels that go that go underground and it's just a straight shot from this part to that part and up above there's like all these twists and turns and traffic right so like either like a something on top or that you're you're bypassing all of these possible delays um through this process of davening with bitzel and then that enables all this godly light to come into the world and the result of it like I think this maybe is connected to what you were saying, Carolyn. The result of that is all these blessings come into the world it, in a physical way. These are 12 very physical requests that we daven for. But the we're davening for them from this place of bitzel, or at least we're trying our best to daven from them from this place of bitzel. And maybe that line that we say at the beginning of Shemana reminds us at least that that's what our mindset should be before we daven for all these things. And that itself to address what Tali said, is a proper kavana, you know, just that itself, having that in mind, like, oh, this verse is reminding me that's how I should be approaching these requests, you know, and that's also a high level. I think that Sheva had her hand up. Is she still here? No, she, she's not here anymore, right? Okay. All right. Anyway, so I that, see her. She's here. She is here. Oh, here she yeah. is. Shava, do you still have your question? If you're talking, we can't hear you. You you have to unmute yourself, or maybe you are unmuted, but I still can't hear you. Hmm. 
Okay, I can't hear you much. If you want, you can maybe type it into the chat, um, something maybe with your microphone. Um, anyway, this is the answer basically to our question. However, as you see, there's still quite a bit of the mimer left in section five, there's section five left. Um, before we get to the end of the mimer, but this is really the this is really the basic point of the answer to our question. Um, this is actually a very good stopping point. It's also 10 and 29, like we have another minute, but I'm saying um, the next section of this section of the mimer is going to say to explain these concepts using the terminology of Kabbalah. So now we're going to talk about this Kabbalistically. So it gets very kind of Kabbalistic for a few <laughs> paragraphs. And then the Rebbe says, and now to explain this using the terminology of Chasidus, and then there's the conclusion to the mimer. So um, yeah, basically this is this is a, a proper part pause. Um, and then I think, God willing, we'll probably finish next week and then maybe we could do a review yeah. um, of the mimer. Yeah, review would be very helpful. So thank you so much. Stop that.